Welcome to the 2009, October 2009 meeting of the FCC, starting uh, close to on time. We didn't want to start on time to set a precedent that we wouldn't be able to honor in the future, but uh, every meeting will be a little bit closer to on time than the one <laughs> before it until we get to infinity. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking uh, our first-rate commission staff, uh, including the great team in my office, for their hard uh, and excellent work uh, on the topic that we'll be addressing today. This is a group of public servants dedicated to the well-being of our country, and I am humbled by their commitment and service. With respect to today's topic and with respect to all of the issues our staff tackles, their extraordinary dedication reflects the paramount economic and social importance of building a world-leading 21st century communications infrastructure for our country. Uh, I would also very happily like to welcome uh, to the Commission Mindel De La Torre, uh, who uh, I hope uh, is here. She might be here in the room today. Mindel joined us yesterday. Welcome. Uh, Mindel joined us yesterday as the chief of our International Bureau. Uh, this is great news for the agency, as well as a homecoming for Mindel, who previously served as a deputy bureau chief in the International Bureau, among other responsibilities at the Commission. Most recently, Mandel has been a leading international telecom consultant. She is yet another example of the broadly experienced and superbly talented people who have chosen to join the FCC at this time of enormous opportunity to advance U.S. communications policies here and around the globe. Thank you, Mandel. And let me also acknowledge Rod Porter, who has served so well as acting bureau chief of the International Bureau. Uh, Rod is one of our senior and most experienced Commission staff members. Rod, I think you're here as well. Thank you for your work. Uh, I am so glad that you're here. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Uh, 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 I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that you're staying here. Uh, we're now building a great team at the International Bureau, and we have very much to do. Uh, today, the Commission takes up a matter of considerable importance in its ongoing effort to maximize innovation and investment in our communications networks while advancing the interests of all internet users. The Wireline and Wireless Bureaus and our Office of Engineering and Technology will present their proposal to seek public comment on draft rules to preserve the free and open internet, which has been the font of so much economic growth, job creation, creativity, and civic engagement. Madam Secretary, now returned to your uh, rightful place closer to the dais, would you please introduce our agenda this morning? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to you and good morning, Commissioners. Today's agenda includes one item for your consideration. You will consider a notice of proposed rulemaking on policies to preserve the open internet. This is your agenda for today. The item will be presented jointly by the Wireline Competition Bureau, the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, and the Office of Engineering and Technology. Sharon Gillette, Chief of the Wireline Competition Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Ms. Gillette, would you please proceed? Thank you, and good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. The Internet has transformed our nation's economy, culture, and democracy, and critical to this success has been the Internet's openness and the transparency of its protocols. Today we present to you a draft notice of proposed rulemaking that seeks public input on draft rules to preserve an open internet. This notice is a joint item with the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau and joining me at the table is Ruth Milkman, Chief of the Wireless Bureau. We would like to acknowledge the contributions of our colleagues in the Office of Strategic Planning and Policy Analysis, Office of Engineering and Technology, Office of the General Counsel, Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, and Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. We are pleased that Julie Knapp, Chief of OET, is with us at the table and will discuss a plan for technical outreach going forward. Ruth and I would like to say a special thank you to the WCB and WTB staff teams of Nick Degani, Dan Ball, Bill Kehoe, Matt Warner, Claude Aiken, Jennifer Tomchin, Sandra Danner, John Spencer, and Paul Malmud for their great work on this item. Also at the table are Bill, Dave, Bill Dever, Chief of the Wireline Bureau's Competition Policy Division, and Blaze Sinto, Chief of the Wireless Bureau's Broadband Division. Bill and Blaze will present the item. Today's notice represents the next step 
in an ongoing and long-standing effort at the Commission. The Commission has considered the issue of Internet openness in a wide variety of contexts and proceedings, including a unanimous policy statement in 2005, a notice of inquiry on broadband industry practices in 2007, public comment on several petitions for rulemaking, conditions associated with significant communications industry mergers, the rules for the 700 megahertz spectrum option in 2007, specific enforcement actions, and en banc hearings. Throughout this process, opportunities for public participation have generated over 100,000 pages of input in approximately 40,000 filings from interested parties and members of the public. Today's notice seeks to build upon the existing record at the Commission to identify the best means to achieve the goal of preserving and promoting the open Internet. The notice seeks to do so in a manner that will protect the legitimate needs of consumers, broadband Internet access service providers, entrepreneurs, investors, and businesses of all sizes that make use of the Internet. The notice seeks comment on draft rules to codify the four principles the Commission articulated in its 2005 Internet Policy Statement. Specifically, under the draft rules, subject to reasonable network management, a provider of broadband Internet access service may not prevent any of its users from sending or receiving the lawful content of the user's choice over the Internet, prevent any of its users from running the lawful applications or using the lawful services of the user's choice, prevent any of its users from connecting to and using on its network the user's choice of lawful devices that do not harm the network, or deprive any of its users of the user's entitlement to competition among network providers, application providers, service providers, and content providers. The notice also seeks comment on draft rules that would codify additional principles of non-discrimination and transparency. The draft non-discrimination principle would require that subject to reasonable network management, a provider of broadband Internet access service must treat lawful content, applications, and services in a non-discriminatory manner. The draft transparency principle would require that subject to reasonable network management, a provider of broadband Internet access service must disclose such information concerning network management and other practices as is reasonably required for users and content, application, and service providers to enjoy the protection specified in this rulemaking. Recognizing that the proposed framework needs to balance potentially competing interests while helping to ensure an open, safe, and secure Internet, the notice seeks comment on draft rules that would subject all six principles to reasonable network management. Under the draft rules, reasonable network management would include reasonable practices employed by a provider of broadband Internet access service to reduce or mitigate the effects of congestion on its network or to address quality of service concerns, to address traffic that is unwanted by users or harmful, to prevent the transfer of unlawful content, such as child pornography, and to prevent the unlawful transfer of content, such as to prevent copyright infringement. The draft rules also permit other reasonable network management practices. Further, nothing in the draft rules supersedes any obligation a broadband Internet access service provider may have or limits its ability to deliver emergency communications or to address the needs of law enforcement, public safety, or national or homeland security authorities consistent with applicable law. The notice recognizes that there are and will continue to be Internet protocol-based offerings, we'll call them managed or specialized services, that are often provided over the same networks used for broadband Internet access services, but may differ from broadband Internet access services in ways that suggest a different policy approach. While the proceeding will seek input on how best to define and treat such services, Managed or specialized services could include voice and subscription video services, certain business services provided to enterprise customers, 
and specialized applications like telemedicine, smart grid, or e-learning offerings. Such services may provide consumer benefits and may lead to increased deployment of broadband networks. Accordingly, the notice seeks comment on how the Commission should address managed or specialized IP-based services in order to allow providers to develop new and innovative technologies and business models and to otherwise further the goals of innovation, investment, research and development, competition and consumer choice while safeguarding the open Internet. In particular, the notice asks how the Commission should define the category of managed or specialized services, what policies should apply to them, and how to ensure that broadband providers' ability to innovate and develop valuable new services can coexist with the preservation of the free and open Internet that consumers and businesses of all sizes have come to depend on. The notice affirms that the six principles it proposes to codify would apply to all platforms for broadband Internet access, including mobile wireless broadband, while recognizing that different access platforms involve significantly different technologies, market structures, patterns of consumer usage, and regulatory history. To that end, the notice seeks comment on how, in what time frames or phases, and to what extent the principles should apply to non-wireline forms of broadband internet access, including terrestrial mobile wireless, unlicensed wireless, licensed fixed wireless, and satellite. Because of the rapid growth and increasing use of mobile wireless as a platform for broadband internet access, the notice examines in greater detail the application of the principles to mobile broadband internet access. For example, the notice recognizes unique technical characteristics of mobile networks, such as wide variations in signal levels across service areas and interference from other devices, and seeks comment on the implications of these characteristics in evaluating the reasonableness of network, of network management practices. Today's notice is the beginning of, a, of the process towards adopting clear, enforceable, and common sense rules of the road that broadband providers and Internet companies of all sizes can build their businesses around. The adoption of this notice will open a window for submitting comments to the FCC. Comments can be filed through the Commission's electronic comment filing system and are due on Thursday, January 14th. Reply comments are due on Friday, March 5th. In addition, the rulemaking process will include many opportunities for public input, including public workshops on key issues, providing feedback through openinternet.gov, which will include regular blog posts by Commission staff and other new media tools, including IdeaScale, an online platform for brainstorming and rating solutions to policy challenges. Julie Knapp will now talk about technical outreach. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, we recognize that our decisions in this rulemaking must reflect a thorough understanding of current technology and future technological trends. To ensure that we have this understanding, the Office of Engineering and Technology will create an inclusive, open, and transparent process for obtaining the best technical advice and information from a broad range of engineers. We will fully explore technical issues, such as what constitutes reasonable network management practices, how to ensure transparency and disclosure of network practices, and how we can prevent any detrimental impact on the delivery of wireline and wireless internet services. We'll provide further details about this process in the near future. The bureaus recommend adoption of this notice and request editorial privileges. Thank you. Thanks to, uh, to each of you for that uh, excellent and very helpful presentation. Um, we will now hear any comments from my colleagues on the bench. Commissioner Copps, you, would you Mr. like Chairman, to comment? I would like to comment. This is uh, a truly historic day at the FCC. It is historic because the Commission takes a long stride, perhaps its longest ever, toward ensuring a free, open, and dynamic Internet. While in one sense, 
Today's notice of proposed rulemaking marks a natural progression from our adoption of the Internet Policy Statement <coughs> excuse me, in 2005. In reality, it is the clearest statement yet that we will ensure that the genius of the Internet is not subverted as it leaves its infancy and begins to come of age. We must start from the premise that we are dealing with something very precious here. A technology leap as great as a printing press that was invented 570 years ago. This is perhaps the greatest small-d democratic platform ever devised. In its capacity to facilitate communications, indeed to manage almost the totality of the communications that take place among us, the potential power of this technology is awesome. It can do so much good. Misused, it can fail itself and fail us all. So I start from the premise that we as regulators, we as businesses, we as users, all of us have an historic obligation to maintain the freedom of the net. I have advocated long and hard for the Commission to establish a mechanism to ensure that consumers have continued access to a vibrant and open Internet, an Internet that was born on openness, thrived on openness, and depends on openness to realize its potential. This Commission will act, I predict, to maintain that openness. We need rules of the road to make that happen. We need expert judgment to evaluate any and all allegations that the freedom of the Internet is being compromised. And we need a venue with authority to redress such wrongs if, indeed, such wrongs are found. I stated my preference for clear-cut rules, including a fifth principle of non-discrimination at the time we adopted the four principles of the Internet policy statement. Now, four years later, having gained a lot more knowledge and some practical experience in applying the principles of Internet openness, we finally step up to the critical challenge of developing meaningful, predictable, transparent, and clearly enforceable rules of the road. And we propose a sixth rule of transparency. Users have a right to know how the network is being managed and what practices providers are employing. The sixth rule of transparency is not just good policy, it is essential policy. The notice we adopt today is not only a clarion call for Internet freedom, it is also a reasoned and rational way to get there, a data-driven, on-the-record examination of how to safeguard the benefits of the Internet for American consumers from potential gatekeeper control. The Internet must never be about powerful gatekeepers and walled gardens. It must always be about the smoothest flow of communications among people. As consumers increasingly access the Internet via different technology platforms, we seek to develop rules to preserve Internet openness regardless of how consumers choose to access it. History tells us that when technological capability to exercise control combines with a financial incentive to do so, some will try to turn this power and this opportunity to their own advantage. That doesn't mean I expect this to become normal business practice, but even if it's only a few who try, the risk to our interconnected and interdependent Internet is too great to take. I'm not into riverboat gambles that everything will be fine if we just look the other way. We recognize in the four principles, as well as in the draft rules we propose today, that a well-considered approach to an open Internet should take into account reasonable network management. Evolutionary and revolutionary changes can alter the landscape and even change the parameters of what is or is not reasonable at a particular time. What is reasonable today may be unreasonable tomorrow, and vice versa. What constitutes reasonable network management in a 768 kilobit per second world will likely be very different from reasonable network management in a 50 or 100 megabits per second world. And what constitutes reasonable network management in a wireless world will differ from reasonable network management in a wireline world. The proposed rules recognize this reality, and they provide the expert venue, the FCC, where consumers can come if they have concerns or complaints to make. It's about as commonsensical a way to ensure an open and dynamic Internet as I can imagine. The principles I pushed for in the Internet policy statement four years ago focused on consumer rights. This is, after all, a consumer protection agency. 
While just about everybody gains from the availability of an open Internet, no one gains so much as consumers. As we move forward with draft rules, the legal language in the notice shifts from the rights of consumers to the obligations of providers. But let's be clear that the consumer focus has not shifted a whit. While some may prefer the broad language of the original principles, it is important to be clear as to whom the obligations apply. And that being said, I am pleased that we seek comment here on the pros and cons of applying these rules to entities other than broadband internet access service providers. In particular, we need to recognize that the gatekeepers of today may not be the gatekeepers of tomorrow. And our job is not so much to mediate among giants as it is to protect consumers. Though we may differ in some respects on the substance of today's proceeding, I want to commend the spirit of collegiality and compromise that my colleagues have shown in shaping the notice we adopt today. I know we often say this at these agenda meetings, but wow, it's really true here. It's true like I've seldom seen before. Chairman Janikowski has set a new tone of openness. He has consulted with the experts, studied the record, met with stakeholders, large and small, walked the halls of the eighth floor to understand the concerns of his colleagues and to search for the resolution of differences. The notice is much the better for it. You will see in this notice of proposed rulemaking something we haven't seen often in other NPRMs in recent years, the actual language of the proposed rules. How's that for a change? And how better to stimulate discussion and build a meaningful record than giving the public something specific to react to? Moreover, to ensure a thoughtful, well-considered, and participatory result, one that's based on the best possible record, we ask many questions and refrain from tentative conclusions. Also, we seek to fully develop the record by providing an extensive period for public comment. So, Mr. Chairman, I salute you, not just for the substance of what we will shortly uh, vote on, but on the process that brings this item to us today and that will continue to guide us going forward. Now the ball is in the public arena. The notice earnestly solicits stakeholder input. Indeed, this proceeding will rise or fall on the quality of such input. Final action will be forthcoming in this proceeding. This commission will act, and it will act on the record it amasses. What will help us most is not flocks of chicken littles running around proclaiming that the sky is falling, but rather facts, data, and the real world experiences of innovators and entrepreneurs and industries large and small, consumers, and anyone interested enough to give us the benefit of their thoughts, their experiences, and their recommendations. So operating on the old adage that decisions without you can sometimes be decisions against you, I urge every individual and every group with an interest to bring us the best and brightest thinking of which they are capable. In addition to thanking the chairman, I want to commend my three other colleagues. If their engagement on this item is any indication, and I think it is, of how this new commission will conduct its deliberations, I am very optimistic about what we will be able to accomplish. I appreciate uh, also the input we have already received from a wide gamut of stakeholders, and I can report, and you will see, that this did indeed make a difference. And finally, I am grateful to my hardworking staff and to the chairman's hardworking staff and my colleagues' hardworking staffs, uh, and certainly to all of the bureaus who worked so very long and very hard and very successfully, I think, to bring this item to us today. So thank you all for a job well done. Thank you, Commissioner Copps. Uh, Commissioner McDowell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And at the outset, I would like to echo uh, Commissioner Copps' uh, praise of the chairman. I'd like to thank him for his graciousness and his good faith, as well as for the energetic spirit of cooperation he has ma maintained throughout his brief tenure, but especially in the past three weeks as we have examined this notice of proposed rulemaking. Although we may sometimes disagree on substance, I commend him on his persistent eagerness to maintain an open and constructive dialogue with his fellow commissioners in an effort to promote a healthy process for this agency, something we've all been working towards for quite some time. And today we do disagree on some substance, 
I do not share the majority's view that the Internet is showing breaks and cracks, nor do I believe that the government is the best tool to fix it. I also disagree with the premise that the Commission has the legal authority to regulate Internet network management as proposed today. Nonetheless, it is important for everyone to remember that today the Commission is starting a process, not ending one. The window of opportunity for dialogue is just beginning to open. Furthermore, today's action provides ample opportunity for the public to comment on a wide universe of issues. In that vein, I thank the Chairman for including in today's notice of proposed rulemaking the text of proposed rules for public comment. For too long, the Commission has fallen into the habit of obscuring from public view the text of proposed rules. I'm delighted that the Chairman has taken this step toward better tra transparency. The Chairman should also be complimented on providing a long and thorough comment period during which I hope a deep and substantial record based on the facts, the law, and the public interest will emerge to illuminate a path to a sensible resolution of these important issues. I look forward to working with Julie Knapp and, and the tech advisory effort as well, and I think that's a, a great stroke, a great move. All of us can agree that the Internet is a tool that should maximize freedom. Consumers should be able to enjoy the fruits of Internet freedom, and the Internet itself should operate under freedom. America's policies and the policies of all governments should seek to strengthen such freedoms. We all agree that an open Internet should be preserved. Accordingly, in today's spirit of collegiality, those who disagree with the substance of today's notice which uh, carry with it uh, the caption, uh, which carries with it the caption, preserving the open internet, should not be presumed opposed to an open internet. With freedom in mind, the internet is perhaps the greatest deregulatory success story of all time. It became successful not by government fiat, but by all interested parties working together toward a common goal. By definition, the internet a global network of networks is a wiki environment which we all pay for, share, and shape. Since it was opened up for public use, as a free society, we have worked hard to ensure that the Internet remains robust, safe, and open. Also, since its inception, uncounted dedicated souls have worked to ensure that the Internet works, period. Since the early days of the state-run ARPANET, Network management and internet governance initiatives have migrated further away from government regulation, not closer to it. This evolution away from government intervention has been the most important ingredient in the internet's success. Early efforts to keep the internet open and free sparked the creation of non-state controlled internet governance entities staffed by volunteer engineers, academics, and software developers. I won't name them all now, but we know many of them. These groups have remained largely self-governed, self-funded and nonprofit, with volunteers acting on their own and not on behalf of their employers. No government owns or regulates them. By creating flat internet governance mechanisms that collaboratively work from the bottom up rather than relying on a government mandated top-down model, the internet is better able to flourish as an entity that promotes freedom at all levels. By, well, by way of illustration, some have argued that nations whose governments regulate the Internet less live under more freedom, while societies that regulate it more live under less freedom. Or as Thomas Jefferson observed more than two centuries ago, quote, the course of history shows that as government grows, liberty decreases, end quote. As I participated in the International Telecommunication Union's conference in Geneva two weeks ago, I was reminded how closely the international community watches the FCC's movements. After I spoke with regulators from other nations from all over the world, it became obvious to me that some countries are waiting for the U.S. to assert more government authority over the Internet to help justify an increased state role over Internet management internationally. It is not an exaggeration to say that the world is watching what we do. Although we are proceeding with the best of intentions, as we examine the important issues raised in today's notice, we should keep in mind that our final actions, inadvertently, could be setting a precedent for some foreign governments with less pure motives to use in justifying stricter Internet regulation. That would be a mistake. 
Freedom is best served if we promote abundance, collaboration, and competition over regulation and rationing. No government has ever succeeded in mandating innovation and investment. We are here today in part because we have seen a deepening division between some network operators and some in the application industry. Some in the applications industry are calling for government regulation of network engineering problems that historically have been resolved through many collaborative bodies. Such collaborative bodies have never failed to resolve major network management challenges. This is a track record that government simply cannot match. One of my concerns regarding today's notice is that its premise looks at innovation in a way that could actually deepen the division between applications and networks precisely at a time when the market is sparking unprecedented convergence between the two. For instance, many proponents of network management regulations speak of unfettered innovation at the edge of networks, such as on consumers' personal computers and wireless devices, while the freedom to innovate in the middle of networks should be more limited due to concerns regarding potential anti-competitive conduct by network operators. Today's notice and its proposed rules could be viewed as operating from a similar pr uh, premise, however, which could produce counterproductive results. Constructive public policy should subscribe to the philosophy that unfettered innovation should be encouraged equally at all points of the network, at the edge, and in the core. As a practical matter, it is fast becoming impossible to separate the two. Consumers are telling the marketplace that they don't want networks that operate merely as dumb, pi dumb pipes. Sometimes they want the added value and efficiency that comes from intelligence inside networks as well. Those who oversimplify this issue as a zero-sum scenario between a dumb pipe and smart edge versus a smart pipe and dumb edge offer only a false choice that does not reflect the realities of today's market. I hope that yesterday's joint blog post between Google and Verizon Wireless on the importance of the consumer internet experience is the start of continued collaboration and dialogue among these two communities. Some questions that I hope get addressed in the record are, is the Commission suggesting today that the government draw a bright line of distinction between networks and applications in an effort to justify regulation in this space? If so, should not the Commission refine its view because networks and applications are converging faster than regulators can measure? Otherwise, would the Commission, commission not be favoring one market player over another, absent evidence of abuse of market power? For example, Cisco builds internet routers that contain over 28 million lines of code. How are we to ascertain whether each line of code offers a pure operating system function or some other application that adds value? Should that be the Commission's role? Can we make such determinations efficiently? Do we even have the statutory authority to do any of this? These thorny questions abound, and I strongly encourage commenters to fill the record with solid facts and legal theories to substantiate their points of view. Furthermore, as we go forward, I hope we can explore the differences between discriminatory conduct and anti-competitive conduct. The public interest would be better served if the debate would focus more on this dichotomy. During the course of this debate, many have confused the important difference between discriminatory conduct and anti-competitive conduct. But the reality is that the Internet can function only if engineers are allowed to discriminate among different types of traffic. The word discriminate carries with it many negative connotations. But to network engineers, it means network management. Discriminatory conduct in the network management context does not necessarily mean anti-competitive conduct. For example, to enjoy online video downloads without interruption or distortion, Consumers expect video bits to be given priority over other bits, such as email bits. Such conduct is discriminatory, but not necessarily anti-competitive. If discriminatory conduct were to become anti-competitive conduct, then could it not be addressed in the context of competition and antitrust laws? While today's notice provides an opportunity to comment on the applicability of such laws, I hope that the record will contain a relevant market analysis before we venture further. Without a finding of a concentration of market power and abuse of such power in the broadband market, uh, is additional regulation likely not warranted? In fact, just over two years ago, the Commission launched an inquiry into the state of the broadband services market. 
We cast a wide net in an effort to harvest evidence of fundamental market failure, and we came up empty. Similarly, after a lengthy and thorough market analysis, the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, issued a report on the state of the broadband market just 27 months ago. In a unanimous and bipartisan 5-0 to zero vote, the FTC strongly cautioned against imposing Internet regulation, saying, quote, we suggest that policymakers proceed with caution in evaluating calls for network neutrality regulation. No regulation, however well intended, is cost free. And it may be particularly difficult to avoid unintended consequences here where the conduct at which regulation would be directed largely has not yet occurred. Policymakers should be very wary of network neutrality regulation." End quote. What tectonic market changes have occurred since the 2007 FTC report that would warrant a change in policy? Since the Supreme Court's decision in the Brand X case, we have been busy taking broadband services out of the common carriage realm of Title II and classifying them as largely unregulated Title I information services due to market conditions. So an important question to ask might be, to what degree would a lack of a change in market conditions threaten the viability of new regulations on appeal? Some point to less than a handful of troublesome actions, some several years old, by a few market players as sufficient ev evidence to justify a new regulatory regime. An important fact lacking in this debate, however, is that once these actions were brought to light, all were resolved without imposing new regulations. Additionally, given the context of the uncountable number of internet communications that occur every day, is such a small number of quickly resolved incidents evidence that the internet is breaking to the point of needing more regulation? As the Commission embarks upon this regulatory journey, we should do so with our eyes wide open regarding the potential consequences of our actions, be they beneficial or harmful, and intended or unintended. For instance, the recent 700 megahertz auction teaches important lessons about unintended consequences. I cast the only dissent against the open access requirements because the evidence in the record told me that the market was already headed toward offering more device and application portability. As it turns out, not only were several Wi-Fi enabled handsets already on the market at the time of our order, but more importantly, several carriers, device manufacturers, and application providers were working together to produce open devices and open networks long before even a draft of the 700 megahertz order was uh, contemplated. At the time, I also did not think that the rule would achieve the advertised goal of attracting a new national broadband provider. Additionally, I was concerned that larger carriers would avoid the encumbered spectrum and outbid smaller players in the smaller, unregulated spectrum blocks. Sadly, my fears proved to be correct, but I do wish I had been wrong. Hopefully, we can all learn from that experience, that even with the best of intentions, our rules can produce unpredictable outcomes that cause unforeseen harms. Looking toward the future, network engineers forecast that Internet traffic will grow five-fold in the next three to four years. They also predict that when all television and video is personalized and sent over the Internet, there will be 30 times more traffic than today's network can accommodate. These traffic levels could materialize in less than 10 years, depending on how quickly user viewing habits change. Such congestion in the core requires constant and careful investment and management to ensure that consumers get the experience they expect while service providers expand their networks. Hopefully, all of us can also agree today that we will avoid adopting rules that may inadvertently stunt the growth of the network. With that, in mind, with that in mind, I want again to thank Chairman Janikowski for providing edits that allow for ample opportunity to comment on ways to achieve the goal of preserving an open Internet without additional regulation. Policies that promote abundance and competition serve as an antidote to potential anti-competitive conduct. If one market player were to manipulate Internet content or applications in an anti-competitive manner, sufficient competition would obviate the need for regulation by offering consumers multiple choices in last mile providers. During the past few years, the Commission has worked diligently to, ad to adopt policies that have produced more last mile competition by making it easier for competitors to deploy fiber into American neighborhoods, 
auctioning new slices of the radio spectrum for powerful new broadband services and opening up the television white spaces for un unlicensed uses. In the past decade, however, most American consumers have had only two broadband platforms to choose from, a cable company and a phone company. This limited choice has produced a fear among, among proponents of regulation that last mile providers could act in anti-competitive ways that limit consumer freedom on the internet. But the reality is the days of the broadband duopoly are ending. Robust competition is budding and more is on the way. Moreover, as we work on our na national broadband plan for Congress, we should be mindful that investors of all sizes and at all stages of company uh, formation, as well as objective market analysts, have warned us that new regulation may frighten away critical investment capital needed to build America's broadband future. Accordingly, I hope that we will seriously consider the idea of having the Commission play a leadership role in helping to spotlight incident instances of market failure and conveying them to appropriate non-governmental collaborative bodies for review and action in an effort to avoid the unintended consequences of new regulation. This model, supported by strict enforcement of our antitrust laws, could very well provide the benefits sought by proponents of new rules without incurring the unexpected costs of a new regulatory regime. Although I respectfully disagree with the factual and legal pre predicates that have produced the item today, I agree that if we are to have rules, the proper way to proceed is a notice of proposed rulemaking containing the text of proposed rules. These issues are complicated and highly technical and deserve the lengthy comment period the chairman has suggested. The longer time frame may also allow us to receive guidance from the court on our legal authority to proceed as may be decided in the Comcast BitTorrent appeal. Let me reiterate that this is the beginning of a process. No irreversible decisions have been made. We have started a debate in the context of a healthy process. We can agree in part and disagree in part and be respectful and collegial about it all. I hope that all of us are entering into this with open minds that can be changed purely by the facts and the law. I also thank the staff, my staff, the chairman's staff, the staff of my colleagues, and um, my, my office staff, and all the staff here who have worked very long hours um, uh, and into the evening and early in the morning for all their hard work to produce this item. So it is in this spirit of collegiality and good faith that I respectfully dissent in part on the factual and legal, legal predicates and concur in part on the process. But instead of ending on that note, let me close with a quote for, from someone we all know who had a great deal of influence over how the internet became privatized. Quote, though government played a role in financing the initial development of the internet, its expansion has been dri driven primarily by the private sector. For electronic commerce to flourish, the private sector must continue to lead. Innovation, expanded services, broader participation, and lower prices will arise in a market-driven arena, not in an environment that operates as a regulated industry. Accordingly, governments should encourage industry self-regulation wherever appropriate and support the efforts of private sector organizations to develop mechanisms to facilitate the successful operation of the Internet. Even where collective agreements or standards are necessary, private entities should, where possible, take the lead in organizing them." End quote. This, of course, comes from the presidential directive announcing the framework for global electronic commerce signed by President Bill Clinton in 1997. As we go forward, I think it may be advice worth heeding. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner McDowell. Commissioner Clyburn. Good morning, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Many years ago, long before the Internet became what it is today, I owned and operated a small business in Charleston, South Carolina. That business, a weekly newspaper called the Coastal Times, primarily focused on issues affecting the African American community. As a small business owner, I participated in every aspect of the newspaper. I wrote and edited articles. I sold advertising. I hired and managed employees. No task was too big or too small. Building the Coastal Times from the ground up was a painstaking process, but a labor of love. There was one underlying reality I could not escape, however, no matter what I did. 
no matter how many hours I put in or what kind of product I produced, I could never achieve an equal footing with the region's larger media outlets. The cost of entry were far too great. As one small example, while the traditional newspapers could afford their established distribution networks to deliver their product, my distribution network was me and my 1992 GMC Jimmy. In the end, the cost of doing business for a smaller outfit like mine proved to be insurmountable. So after 14 years of sweat, tears, and some, well, you, you get the picture. The Coastal Times newspaper published its final issue, and a voice in an underrepresented community fell short. I offer this personal story this morning because the substance of this proceeding reminds me of my challenges in running the Coastal Times. I cannot help but wonder, what if I had a website? Let's call it uh, thecoastaltimes.com. And how would that have changed the outcome? One thing is certain. My distribution challenge would have been greatly diminished. All things considered, online the publication's success or failure would have been far more likely to be determined by the quality of the product, rather how well capitalized it was. This web-based scenario assumes, however, as does every internet success story out here today, an open platform. Because if my larger competitors were simply able to buy their way ahead of my small publication, if my content were delivered at inferior speeds and or quality, then the coastaltimes.com would simply be an online version of my old GMC Jimmy, GMC Jimmy with its 300 plus, yes, 300 plus thousand miles. And it's still sitting in my yard, by the way. An open net internet is, perhaps as much as anything else, the great equalizer. It allows people with innovative ideas to succeed on the merit of those ideas. It also provides a voice to those who are often not afforded one. Smaller businesses can compete despite not being firmly established or well financed on day one. The quality of the product or opinion stands for itself and consumers are the ultimate arbiters of which businesses thrive at the end of the day. To me, that's what this proceeding is all about. Preventing barriers to entry and ensuring that Americans have access to the best and most useful information and services. And that is why I am pleased to support this item, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. I believe that preserving an open internet is essential, not only to safeguard everything that the internet does for us today, but also to help address current challenges such as the digital divide. I would be remiss if I did not take a moment to address the process going forward. First, to echo my colleagues, I applaud the chairman for his thoughtful and participatory approach to this issue. After working closely with each of our offices and after listening to some of the constructive feedback offered by outside parties, the chairman and his staff made some important changes that have significantly strengthened this notice. This process has brought us closer to developing an open internet rule, or open internet rules that will foster innovation and investment, promote competition, and most importantly, protect consumers. Second, I want to emphasize that I'm eager to see a thoughtful, rational, and respectful record in this proceeding. Our field has so many talented people with great minds who can help us make this undertaking a success. We have already, or we have recently seen, collaborative, collaboration among disparate parties. We've seen that that is certainly possible. Unfortunately, some parties seem to prefer radioactive rhetoric and unseemly and unbecoming tactics. Such an approach may yield headlines, but will not yield positive results with me. So let us permit our better selves to emerge during this process. Together, we can develop clear and reasonable rules of the road for industry 
and ensure that we have a robust internet that continues to drive the economy and provide countless benefits for the American consumer. For my part, I pledge to look at the record with an open mind and to treat each submission with the seriousness it deserves. I am looking forward to an honest, open, and a direct exchange to make sure we get this proceeding right. I would like to thank the staff and my staff for the excellent work on this item. I look forward to working with all of you and with the, my fellow commissioners as we proceed toward final rules to preserve an open internet and solidly and to solidify, let me say that again, as we proceed toward these final rules to preserve an open internet. I look forward to a solid foundation that we will build for our economic prosperity in the days ahead. I thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Clyburn. Commissioner Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I believe, I believe in the open internet and the free flow of lawful content over the internet. Of course, we all do. The unrestricted flow of information on the internet has enabled unprecedented innovation and investment in communications technologies and services and brought immeasurable benefits to consumers of all kinds. I don't want to do anything that would jeopardize that. I think we must cast a watchful eye to the nascent internet ecosystem, complex and rapidly evolving force that empowers a whole new way of doing business, new technologies, new ideas, and new jobs. I don't want to get in the way of that. I also believe that we must never cease to find ways to create incentives for investment across the internet, an economic engine that is just beginning to demonstrate its power to transform the way we live, to energize our economy, and to solidify our leadership internationally. I believe very strongly that openness must thrive across the internet as a whole. We must find ways to enable innovation and investment from end to end, not just applications at the edge, but also the network's vibrant, dynamic, and technically evolving core. This is important because if innovation and investment are confined to the corners of the internet, consumers will suffer. I am particularly sensitive to the fact that all actions that we take at the Commission are carefully watched, not only here but also abroad, to gauge the future of the internet. When I think of an open internet in the international context, I think of the importance of the free flow of all types of lawful information over the internet which the Internet, has, which the United States has championed since the early days of the Clinton administration. It is the openness we sought to preserve in rigorous discussions with the leaders of other countries around the world while I was at NTIA, and the openness we upheld during the World Summit on the Information Society process, and the openness we fought hard to capture in the Tunis commitment. I believe that those freedoms, that openness, are no less relevant today, and the role the United States plays in defending them remains critical. We cannot retreat. On this, there is no disagreement at this commission, and I make this point lest the rest of the world should get the wrong idea. I dissent in part today because, as a threshold matter, I am not convinced that there is a sufficient record to establish that a problem exists that should be addressed by commission rules. As I have said previously, we should not adopt regulations to address anecdotes where there is no fact-based evidence that persuasively demonstrates a problem exists. My concerns about the need to regulate are heightened in several of the areas that are covered by the item before us today. We must be particularly careful before we risk extending any Internet principles to mobile broadband, which is rapidly becoming the driving force in Internet uptake and use. We need to look hard at what we are proposing to call special or managed services and whether codifying rules will thwart or encourage their development. We need to know much more about the parameters of reasonable network management before we consider acting. And the same is true for the principle or concept of non-discrimination. 
I also think that important questions are outstanding about our legal authority to regulate broadband internet access services that we need to explore. We need to better understand the law, engineering, and economics. Before imposing new rules, we need to think carefully through all potential unintended consequences that could harm consumers by increasing prices, impeding innovation, eliminating choices, and or reducing quality of service. For these reasons, when we began this process three weeks ago, I was prepared to dissent with respect to this entire initiative. But I'm not there today. Although I'm not convinced that the rules are necessary or useful at this time, I'm now equally convinced that it is reasonable to take a step back and ask tough and probing questions about the Internet as it exists today and about where we want it to be tomorrow. And I realize that this is the start of the process. I hope for a broad and substantive participation in this proceeding so that we will have a solid record that will provide us with a complete and accurate understanding of the Internet ecosystem. I support that effort, and I think that this item includes thoughtful questions to direct the debate to come. I want to thank Gen uh, Chairman Janikowski and his staff for their good faith efforts to make this a better document. I commend the Chairman for putting action behind his commitment to a cooperative approach at the Commission and for his emphasis on fact-based policy analysis founded on evidence in an open and transparent record. I hope that this will set us on a constructive road for working together to make better communications policy in the months and years ahead. There are already encouraging signs that this will prove to be a productive approach outside the Commission as well. As a member in the minority at this Commission, I appreciate that we have demonstrated that we can disagree without being disagreeable where our policy perspectives just cannot line up. I particularly want to acknowledge the steps the Chairman is proposing to ensure that there is ample record upon which we can move forward. I note in particular the extended comment period that has been proposed, as well as the establishment of the technical advisory process to make sure that the steps that we take in the future are informed by the laws of physics, not merely by the law of politics. I look forward to having the chance to hear from the business people, both large and small, from the inventors and the technical experts, and to working together to achieve a broad-based consensus with respect to the way forward. With input from a broad range of parties who are willing to roll up their sleeves and work together, I believe that we can find the right way. Finally, I would be remiss not to recognize the tremendous job of the staff across the Commission that have done an awful lot to move this docu document forward. The bureaus, the chairman's staff, my staff, it reflects real progress over the past few weeks in the kind of constructive collaboration that I hope will be the hallmark of the workings of this Commission. While I remain skeptical about the need for regulation here, I also remain open to new ideas, and I look forward to reviewing the record to be developed here. I believe the document before us outlines a thoughtful process to develop a record to inform our next steps. It is balanced and comprehensive. It asks good, pertinent questions and offers suggestions about a flexible approach in the future that is worth considering carefully and at length. Thank you. Commissioner Baker, thank you very much. I, I would like to begin by thanking my colleagues on the Commission. Uh, we are still getting to know each other. Some might have expected that the issue we consider today, with its long and fraught history, could have driven us apart. That has not happened. We've had healthy and productive discussion and collaboration. And while there are some areas of perhaps unsurprising disagreement, the more significant fact is that there are substantial areas of agreement. Today's notice focuses on the Internet, the most significant technological breakthrough of our time. What started as an arcane lab experiment has developed into an unparalleled platform for innovation and investment an engine for job creation and economic growth, and a vibrant forum for civic engagement. This development is due in large part to a single element of the Internet's design, its openness. The Internet is and has been an open platform, and it is that openness and the extraordinary benefits it has brought our country that we seek to preserve through the proceeding we launched today. The Internet's openness has allowed entrepreneurs and innovators, small and large, 
to create countless applications and services without having to seek permission from anyone. As a result, Internet pioneers with little more than a good idea and a no-frills Internet connection have built hundreds, of tha hundreds and thousands of small businesses, as well as web giants. More and more Americans depend on the Internet every day, at home, at work, in school, at our desks, and on the move. The Internet connects us to our family and friends, to the universe of knowledge, and to the working of our nation's democracy. The Internet has provided enormous benefits to consumers in the form of new and previously unimaginable services, competition, and choice. We wouldn't have these services without a strong network infrastructure and the billions of dollars of private capital invested to build it. And ever-growing consumer demand is driving billions of dollars of additional investment to increase broadband capacity and improve the intelligence of the networks. And so we have a virtuous cycle of investment, innovation, jobs, and consumer benefits. According to one study, the Internet supports more than 3 million American jobs. A core goal of the FCC's efforts is to preserve and promote this virtuous cycle driven by a free and open Internet. That's how we'll ensure that the Internet becomes an enduring engine for opportunity and prosperity for all Americans. Given the importance of the Internet, it should come as no surprise that over the past years, the Commission has considered the question of how to safeguard a free and open Internet in more than 10 different proceedings, building a record of over 100,000 pages of comments submitted by approximately 40,000 companies, organizations, and members of the public. In 2005, a unanimous Commission issued the Internet Policy Statement affirming the agency's, quote, duty to preserve and promote the vibrant and open character of the Internet, unquote. In the inter intervening years, the Commission has enforced these principles adopted openness conditions in a number of significant mergers, and placed openness requirements on spectrum licenses. Two years ago, the Commission issued a broad-ranging notice of inquiry that sought comment on many of the issues addressed in today's notice, including the topics of non-discrimination and transparency. Now it's time to take the next step, growing out of the record and the Commission's experience, launching a process to craft common sense and enforceable rules of the road to preserve a free and open Internet. Because, Let's be honest, the Commission's actions, laudable in so many respects, have left the protection of the free and open Internet unnecessarily vulnerable and uncertain. The problem is not merely that we've seen some significant situations, including recently, where Internet service providers have degraded the data streams of popular lawful services and blocked consumer access to lawful applications, even after the Commission adopted its openness principles. Nor is the problem merely that when the policy summarized in the Internet Policy Statement and its initial four principles have been enforced by the Commission on a bipartisan basis, although uh, over a dissent, they have been attacked, including in pending litigation, precisely because they are not rules developed through the kind of notice and public comment process that we commenced today. Nor is the problem merely that the initial four principles failed to address explicitly some important concepts, such as the need for transparency when it comes to network management practices, nor is the problem merely that service providers have understandable economic incentives to favor their own services or to otherwise disfavor competition in ways that may not be entirely consistent with our long-term national interest in promoting consumer choice and preserving a free and open Internet. The heart of the problem is that, taken together, we face the dangerous combination of an uncertain legal framework with ongoing as well as emerging challenges to a free and open Internet. Given the potentially huge consequences of having the open Internet diminished through inaction, the time is now to move forward with consideration of fair and reasonable rules of the road, rules that would be enforceable and implemented on a case-by-case -case basis. Indeed, it would be a serious failure of responsibility not to consider such rules, for that would be gambling with the most important technological innovation of our time. Congress, in its broadband grant provision, rec recognized the importance of taking steps to preserve an open Internet as did the Federal Trade Commission when it recently filed comments in our broadband proceeding. An open Internet deserves an open process. Accordingly, I fully support this notice, which will launch a fact-based, transparent, and participatory process to develop rules to preserve an open Internet. The notice seeks to identify the hard questions the Commission must address as part of this rulemaking, and that the Commission must ultimately address based on the facts and the record before it. And the notice contains draft rules so that all interested parties in the public can have something specific to comment on. This is a procedural form, as we've heard this morning, that has been called for by my fellow commissioners 
and by legislators on a bipartisan basis. Now, in the run-up to today's meeting, there's been a deluge of rumors and no shortage of myths and half-truths. There have also been some reasonable concerns about what the draft rules might look like. My goal has been for us to listen, to pull out and address the fair points and good ideas, regardless of source. And our staff has worked very hard to do so. That said, do any of us think that the draft rules proposed today are perfect? No. Are they set in stone? No. We are at the beginning of a rulemaking process with draft rules offered in the context of a notice that seeks to spot the issues, ask the hard questions, and seek broad public input as against important national principles. We're addressing a topic of great importance where parties have strong views based on differing perspectives and experiences, where the choice of a single word can lead to vigorous, complex, and highly technical debates. I come to this issue, as others do, with a keen recognition that we do not yet have all the answers and that we have a lot of hard work to do. But again, that is precisely the reason to begin this chapter of the process in a way that sets the table for an informed, fruitful discussion about issues of real importance to the future of the Internet and our country. In that spirit, we're announcing today that we will be developing a technical advisory process so that the difficult engineering issues we face are fully informed by a broad range of engineers based on sound engineering principles and not on politics. I've asked Julie Knapp, Chief of our Office of Engineering and Technology, to launch this effort, working closely with Sharon Gillette, Ruth Milkman, and other, senior, uh, sorry, and other key senior staff members leading this process. This will be just one part of what will be a fully participatory effort. OpenInternet.gov is open for business. We will have public workshops modeled on the success of our broadband team's efforts. I will continue to push our staff to develop and experiment with new participatory mechanisms for a 21st century commission, looking for the best ways to build a fact-based process for record building and decision making. While today's proposal recognizes that there are still open questions and hard work to be done, the notice and draft rules also reflect a set of conceptual commitments that I fully endorse. First, the goal is and must remain without compromise, preserving a free and open internet. Any rules we adopt must preserve our freedom to connect, to communicate, and to create that is the wonder of the open internet. Each and every user of the internet must have access to an unlimited online universe of ideas and commerce. Internet users should always have the final say about their online experience, whether it's the software, applications, or services they choose, or the networks and hardware they use to connect to the internet. Many people have fought long and hard for this concept of a free and open internet, inside and outside this commission, making sure that we keep our eye on this powerful aspiration for our country and the world. They deserve our gratitude, and today's action owes very much to their efforts. Second, we must promote investment and innovation broadly. The idea that we must choose between innovation and investment on the edge of the network, where content and applications are developed, or innovation and investment in the core of the network, where broadband providers operate, is a false choice. Our rules can and must promote investment and innovation throughout the Internet ecosystem. I know from my own experience as an investor and an executive, and we all recognize what our broadband team reported to the Commission at our last meeting, that very substantial investment is required for network providers to build our broadband networks for the, the, to build out broadband networks for the entire country and increase the capacity of those networks. The full potential of the Internet cannot be unleashed without robust and healthy broadband networks, and broadband providers need room to experiment with new technologies and business models in order to earn a return on their investment and deploy high-speed broadband to all Americans. This is what give us the kinds of opportunities that we've heard about today, reducing barriers to entry and promoting a wider variety of businesses able to launch new ideas on the Internet. At the same time, the view that anything goes is not a serious argument, and I reject the notion that we must choose between open Internet rules and investment by service providers in their networks. This argument is somewhat routinely made when the FCC considers rules on a variety of topics. History tells us that this, too, is a false choice. FCC rules over the years have been a powerful spur to investment and innovation, especially when the agency focuses on promoting competition and consumer choice. 
And in the context of net neutrality, notwithstanding the issuance in 2005 and enforcement in 2008 of the Commission's openness principles, as well as the adoption of openness conditions and important mergers during that period, Internet service providers have continued to invest very heavily in their networks. As an increasing number of stakeholders agree, investment in advanced and open networks is essential to our broadband future. Third, there must be flexibility. Broadband providers must be allowed meaningful latitude to solve the difficult challenges of managing their networks and providing their customers with a high quality internet experience. We recognize that there are real congestion and other network management issues, especially with respect to wireless broadband and in some categories like telemedicine. We also recognize, of course, that internet technology is developing rapidly. We understand the risk of unintended consequences. Openness rules should be sufficiently general and flexible enough to account for and invite technological change and progress. Fourth, the government's role in preserving openness is important, but also modest. It should be no greater than necessary to achieve the core goal of preserving a free and open internet. Open internet rules should be high level, not heavy handed. And in fact, the draft rules in the notice are less than two pages long. The goal is to provide a fair framework in which all participants in the internet ecosystem can operate, ultimately minimizing the need for government involvement. That is why I have emphasized the new sixth principle, the idea that internet service providers must be transparent about their network management practices, which should foster private resolution of disputes and reduce the need for government enforcement. That, in fact, is the overall goal of an open internet framework. It's also why I've been clear that government should not be in the business of running or regulating the internet. Government should promote competition. It should protect consumers' right to access the lawful content applications and services of their choosing. It should ensure that there is no central authority preventing people or businesses from communicating over the internet. It should certainly not be that central authority. As others have said, the minute that anyone, whether from government or the private sector, starts to control how people use the internet, it is the beginning of the end of the net as we know it. There should be no confusion on this point, at home or abroad. This commission fully agrees that government must not restrict the free flow of information on the internet. Fifth, the internet must be safe and secure as well as open. Open internet rules should apply to lawful content, services, and applications. They are not a shield for copyright infringement, spam, or other violations of the law. They must honor the protection of users' privacy, and they must be consistent with public safety as well as homeland and national security. Sixth, openness is essential for the internet, however it's accessed. It doesn't make sense to have one internet when your laptop is plugged into a wall and another when accessing the internet through a wireless modem. At the same time, wireless networks are different from wired networks. Given fundamental differences in technology, how, when, and to what extent open internet rules should apply to different access platforms, particularly mobile broadband, will undoubtedly vary. This is an important issue on which the notice seeks to develop a full and informed record. Let me close by emphasizing what I think all of us here on the dais believe, that the internet's openness is a precious thing and that it must be preserved and promoted that the Commission does its job best when it has input from all stakeholders and asks hard questions that provoke vigorous debate, and that we have great faith in the strong staff of the FCC working with the broadest possible range of outside participants to navigate through these complex waters. I am pleased that there is broad agreement inside the Commission that we should move forward with a healthy and transparent process on an open Internet I am pleased to see leaders outside the Commission finding common ground on enforceable rules. Given the importance of an open Internet to prosperity and opportunity for all Americans, our country deserves no less. Unless there is any more discussion, we will proceed to a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Dissent in part, part. concurrent part. Uh, all those opposed, say nay. Dissent in part, 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 concurrent part. Uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you to all of you. Um, 
Uh, I will grant editorial privileges if any were requested. I think they were. Uh, let me ask if any of my colleagues have any announcements to make before we close for today. Commissioner Copps? Uh, yeah, none of this is hot off the press news, uh, but I know it's the custom to announce staff changes here. I should have done this in September, but we had a very long session then, so I didn't want to hold people. I'll be brief, but uh, uh, as, as most people know, we have undergone some changes in the Copps uh, office. Uh, uh, Rick Chesson, who had been most recently serving as acting chief of staff of the commission and who had long been my uh, senior legal aide, has, uh, uh, has gone from uh, the commission. I'm uh, uh, forever grateful for his uh, services, and I think he was one of the stellar, uh, stellar people here at the commission for many, many years, and uh, I think was actually present at the creation of the digital era, but he did, uh, he did an outstanding job for us. Uh, we were uh, very fortunate to uh, be able to uh, attract the, uh, the attention and the willingness to move into a, a chief of staff position of John Giusti, who is also very well known here at the commission for his capable leadership, uh, acting leadership of the International Bureau. Anybody who has had the opportunity, you know, we talked a lot about the importance of global affairs and how uh, our actions are viewed globally. He has been just a, a stellar representative of, uh, uh, of our policy, FCC policy, American policy around the globe, and has the attributes of a, of a star diplomat. And uh, I'm delighted to have him serving as uh, uh, chief of staff. Uh, Jennifer Schneider is our senior uh, uh, policy advisor now, so we've kind of uh, uh, shifted the uh, responsibilities uh, a little bit. I'm delighted that she is here and she worked very, very hard along with John on this item that we have before us uh, today. Uh, I also want to take just a moment to uh, thank Paul Murray for uh, his services as my uh, uh, advisor for a number of months uh, before and while I was acting chairman, a uh, wireless uh, advisor. He has gone back to the Bureau, but uh, uh, he remains a uh, uh, someone that we reach out to on uh, on a regular basis. He is, uh, as you know, uh, uh, just invaluable. He understands these issues. He digs into the issues with uh, extraordinary uh, persistence and smarts, and he's just a wonderful human being besides all that. So uh, uh, I know he is, continues to serve the uh, commission. And uh, rounding out our uh, staff, uh, we are lucky to have on, on an interim basis Jamila Best Johnson, uh, uh, serving as acting uh, legal advisor on uh, media affairs. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, Commissioner McDowell, do you have any announcements? Yes, we also uh, have uh, two uh, personnel announcements to make, uh, which we couldn't make at the September meeting. So we have uh, had for several weeks now two wonderful law clerks uh, join us. Uh, if you guys want to stand up, we have Ari Moskowitz and Cody Williams. Uh, Ari is uh, at, he's a law student at uh, George Washington University's Law School. Uh, where he's on the editorial staff of the American Intellectual Property Law Association Quarterly Journal. That's a mouthful. Uh, he undergrad, he went to Harvard, uh, where he majored in philosophy, and he has a, a curious certificate in mind, brain, and behavior, <laughs> which could, could come very handy here in Washington. Um, and then uh, Cody is at uh, George Mason Law School, where he's on the Journal of International Commercial Law, and he's been educated all over, including the University of Pittsburgh and Middle Tennessee State. Uh, both Ari and Cody have uh, studied abroad, Ari in Israel and Cody in Japan, so they're doing a great job. They're also, by the way, no stranger, uh, strangers to the FCC. They've worked uh, in, the, in the bureaus in various offices as well. So uh, these are grizzled veterans of the FCC already at a, at a very young age. So we're delighted to have them. They're doing a great job. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Commissioner Clyburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to welcome to my staff and welcome back to the agency, Dreema Johnson, who is serving as my confidential assistant. Dreema previously served as special assistant to former House Speaker Tom Foley, and as many of you know, served as confidential assistant to uh, former FCC Chairman Bill Kennard. Most recently, she was appointed to the Federal, uh, the Federal Com Commission for the Jamestown 400th anniversary commemoration for, on behalf of Senator Mark Warner and Governor Tim Kaine. Dreamer directed the International Conference Series on Democracy and is directly involved in the compilation and writing of the Jamestown commentaries to be published later this year. In 2001, as you may recall, uh, Dreamer was awarded the FCC Chairman's Award. Um, I'm very happy to welcome Dreamer back to the FCC and to my office 
and uh, I would like to express uh, my uh, heartfelt thanks to Elmira Kennedy for extraordinary efforts in serving as my interim confidential assistant. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Baker? Me too. <laughs> uh, mine are more recent. So um, I first want to give truly a, a real heartfelt thank you to my incredibly uh, talent, uh, talented and dedicated, hardworking, smart, uh, amicable, wonderful interim staff, uh, Bill Friedman, uh, Aaron McGrath, Christy Schumann, and Ann Monahan. Uh, they have toiled tirelessly to indoctrinate me into the wily ways of the FCC and I will be forever grateful. Um, they have introduced me to the depth of experience that exists here and resides here in this building, and they have helped me understand some of the more complex and somewhat tortuous issues that face us. So um, I, I really am incredibly grateful. The past two and a half months have been great. Um, their professionalism and keen intelligence have really made them greatly appreciated in our office, and they will forever be part of the team. So um, I'd also like to announce permanent staff. Uh, Christy Schumann will serve as legal advisor for Wireline and Universal Service. Christy has served a number of roles in the Wireline Competition Bureau since 2003, including Chief of Competition Policy Division. She is an exceptional lawyer, and I am just really pleased that she has agreed to stay. Thank you, Christy. And uh, Charles Mathias will serve as our uh, legal advisor for Wireless International and Public Safety Issues. Charles comes most recently from the Wireless Bureau, and he was working on the National Broadband Plan. Thank you for letting me have him. Um, but he is well known to many of us in this room from his deep experience both in the public and private sector. So we are pleased that Charles will be with us as well. Um, Brad Gillen I see standing in the back of the room. Um, Brad will join us uh, on November 9th. Uh, he will be legal advisor for media. And um, he is coming from Dish Network. And we are just really excited to have his talent here as well. And Millie Kerr. Uh, Millie will be my confidential assistant and our staff attorney. She comes to us from Allen and Overy LLP in London, where she was an associate. And she is also from Texas, graduated the University of Texas Law School. Um, so I really look forward to drawing in their experience and leadership and crafting important policies here at the commission. And I really thank them for their dedication to public service. Thank you. I, I would like to add my uh, welcome and acknowledgement and thank you to the staffs of, of all the commissioners. Um, uh, I, I've seen evidence of just real brilliance, uh, incredible collaboration. Uh, uh, the uh, principles that we talk about, disagreeing without being disagreeable uh, and focusing on what the right answers are to these difficult questions. It's a, it's a pleasure to have each of uh, the, the staffers at the commission. Uh, some have been at the commission a long time, some are new. Uh, and I'm just so pleased that we're attracting such great talent to this agency. Um, I want to again thank uh, the bureaus and offices for working so hard on this. Uh, uh, everyone had a chance to see uh, those members at the dais. Uh, like so many of our items, uh, they involve cross-bureau collaboration. That's the nature of the world that we live in. Uh, very few issues uh, can be handled by only one bureau. They almost always require, and they should almost always require, the input of the General Counsel's Office, our Office of Strategic Planning, and of course more and more uh, bureau staff at all different levels have to work together. Uh, this group on this item has worked together uh, incredibly well. Um, part of the reason, uh, and I want to uh, acknowledge Zach Katz, for playing uh, a coordinating role in really making sure that everyone was speaking with each other, that the issues were being focused on. Uh, this is uh, Zach's only a couple of months into the commission, and like so many other people uh, who are being acknowledged today, didn't really know what they were getting into and should go to the Federal Trade Commission for false advertising claim. <laughs> um, but here they are, working very hard for the public interest, and we really appreciate their work. Um, uh, in my office, uh, I do want to take a minute to uh, thank my team uh, uh, for working so hard on this item and all the, uh, all the work that we have. Uh, they too um, uh, uh, have um, false advertising claims, um, uh, but they never bring it up uh, and they work incredibly uh, hard. I learn something every day. I come to work from my own staff and the staff of the commission as well as others on the eighth floor. Uh, Eddie Lazarus, my chief of staff, um, uh, Bruce Gottlieb, uh, chief counsel, Priya Iyer and Cherise Smith, 
Uh, everyone is working so hard. Uh, I do want to take a minute to uh, thank uh, a couple of people who uh, really get acknowledged but really are on the front lines of, of what we um, try to tackle every day. Uh, Danny Ornstein, special assistant in my office uh, who works around the clock, and my confidential assistant, uh, Maria Gaglio, uh, who thought uh, she saw some tough situations in the private sector, uh, and now um, she's trying to find a, uh, a train ticket uh, back. But I, uh, uh, it's not, <laughs> no, it's not cushy government work. <laughs> Um, so thank you all very much. Uh, I'm sure I'm missing some people, but um, there are so many great people who we all build on to do our work, and, and the truth is we can't acknowledge them enough. Finally, I'd uh, uh, like to introduce Ari Meltzer. Ari, are you here? Uh, an intern in our office this semester. Ari's in his third year at uh, Georgetown Law Center. Before that, he was a segment producer for Good Morning America for three years and worked as news producer in Washington, D.C. in Paducah, Kentucky. Uh, uh, he's not the only person with uh, TV experience that we have coming to the commission. Uh, Ari, thank you for, uh, for being part of uh, uh, our office, and uh, uh, thank you all for your hard work. Uh, if no one has any other comments, Madam Secretary, uh, please announce the date of the next FCC meeting. The next agenda meeting of the Federal Communications Commission will be on Wednesday, November 18, 2009. Thank you. Until then, we stand adjourned.